Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nugentino Cinema. And uh, I'm back today with Kylie. Uh, we reviewed The Northman last time. And uh, today we're going to review Melancholia, uh, directed by Lars von Trier and starring Kirsten Dunst and Charlotte Gainsbourg, Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, Alexander Skarsgård is actually in this, too. He was in The Northman. But, um, yeah, uh, have you ever seen a Lars von Trier movie? No, this was actually my first, and when I was reading about Melancholia and some of his other movies, it seemed like most people thought that this was his most accessible film, yeah. so it was probably a good one to start with, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I would agree. I think it is his most accessible. Uh, there's not really, I and mean, he's known for some pretty shocking and like, provocative stuff in his movies, and uh, there's not really anything too crazy in this. I mean... There, there's some dark material, but it's not like, I mean, if you watch his other movies, there's a lot worse stuff that happens. But um, just, to, uh, just to set up the plot or the idea of it, um, it centers around a family. Kirsten Dunst is getting married at the beginning of the film, and um, it kind of ha- it goes through like, three different acts throughout it. And the whole thing that's happening in the background is that there's a planet that's going to collide with Earth. And uh, it shows how people kind of react to that. But um, so what did you think of the film? I liked it. Um, I thought that it was interesting how it has like um, Justine, like her kind of story and where she's at in the middle of all of this at the beginning of the movie. And then part two is what's going on with Claire but we kind of see how they are interacting through like different points of each other's kind of like story where they're at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Um, And I liked that about it. There were some parts that I felt were kind of slow, but that seemed like it was meant to go along with Justine's like depressive episode. And so Mm -hmm. it made a lot of sense to me as I got further along in the movie So I'd say I enjoyed it, and I'm definitely interested in watching some of his other movies. Yeah. I'd seen it before, and I remember loving it, and I gave it a five the first time. And this rewatch was kind of weird because, I mean, I still liked it a lot uh, as I was watching it. But I kind of felt the slowness at certain points, too, and I was kind of, like, in and out of it. Like, um, but then, like, once, like, the climax hits, like, for some reason, I was just, like still a five i still love it <laughs> right and, uh, like i think the ending is amazing and i think kirsten dunce is great and i think it's a pretty accurate representation hey accurate's not the right word but just a good look at like what depression is like i feel like it looks at like the darkness of depression and like uh for lack of a better way to put it like um because like justine's character like she's kind of unlikable at a certain point. She does like a lot of like messed up things, and uh, I feel like that's what people who are depressed, like very depressed, like make a lot of mistakes and like do a lot of, and like even the way she approaches Claire's character, like when she's talking to them at the end, or she's talking to her at the end about what they're gonna do as the planet collides and they all die, die basically, uh, and she's like kind of like like mocking her because she wants to drink wine and like listen to Beethoven it's all like very harsh but um well and I, I just found like... it an interesting juxtaposition about how she's more able to handle these like extreme situations Kirsten Dunst's character and Claire's character is more like she can't like she's like a complete anxiety and like terror and like that's what I love that last shot as the planet collides and she's so calm and like and Claire's sitting there like freaking out and um, I just thought it was an interesting look at the strengths of somebody going through somebody going through something like very dark, like serious depression, and the strengths of somebody that's more together, but also the weaknesses. Like, you know what I mean? Right. And just looking yeah. at it in a way you wouldn't usually look at it. No, I agree. And like thinking about how it depicts like being in a deep depression, like it kind of feels like everybody is an unlikable character Mm -hmm. like during that part of the film. And I think that's also kind of true 
to being depressed because like you don't want anybody to like you know talk to you or like try to pull you out of it and like so I felt like I don't it was just done really well as like putting the audience into that state because in both part one and part two like I felt what it felt like to be depressed like how slow everything was going and like she takes a nap during her wedding she takes a bath during her wedding like Mm -hmm. she doesn't want to be there and she's doing everything that she can to kind of remove herself from it and then you get into Claire's portion of the movie and I was like so anxious during that part of the movie because everything is like kind of just really bothering her Mm -hmm. and putting her on edge and so I like how that came through because sometimes I feel like when I'm watching a movie that's trying to put those kinds of emotions into it I don't leave feeling those feelings but with this I really did yeah yeah I think it's a pretty good representation of it and I know Lars von Trier himself has dealt with like a serious depression so I don't know, he might just be, I'm sure he could be drawing from some sort of experience, but um, yeah, I think it's really well done. Uh, I love the music in it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's all like a lot of classical music, but I think it's like used really well. And, yeah, I thought so yeah. too. Mm-hmm. And all the performances I think are great. Like it has an interesting like ensemble. I mean, we're mostly focused on Kirsten Dunst and Charlotte Gainsbourg, but like you got Kiefer Sutherland in there, who I thought was good. She's a... He's Claire's husband. Um, a lot of people that are only at the beginning in like the wedding sequence, like Stellan Skarsgård and then Alexander Skarsgård. Um, I think John Hurt was her dad. Um, he's like an old man. Um, who else? Maybe that's it. But um, yeah, I love the opening wedding sequence. Um, it reminded me a little bit of uh, Rachel getting married, which I hadn't seen at the time when this came out, but I've seen now. And uh, Like, the whole genre of, like, wedding films and, like, weddings, like, going wrong is a pretty good genre, I think. I think so, too, because I think, I mean, I don't know. I've never been to a wedding where something has gone really wrong like that, but I can imagine that it's just a disaster, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I liked the scene where... Her mom is telling her, like, I don't want to give a speech. I don't want to give a speech. And then their father gives his speech. And the mom, like, stands up and, like, says all this stuff about being against marriage and things like that. Yeah. Um, And that seems, I guess, does she take a bath before or a nap before that? Or is it after? Because I thought that that was what kind of, like, set everything off. I think it's after. Okay. Yeah. And it could be definitely that. But um, I thought it was strange. I guess it makes sense. Like how she just chooses to like cheat on her husband like that night. Like because he seems so perfect and like nothing's even wrong. But I just guess she doesn't even want to be there. And like that's not, not that there's no reason. Like I don't know. But I just didn't like, I didn't like, I couldn't tell exactly what was going on there. Like in her head. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it just shows, like, how much she has disassociated from her own life that she would cheat on her husband on her wedding night because, like, she doesn't really seem to be interested in being a part of the festivities. And in some ways, they seem like... Sorry, I can cut that out, or we can just go back to where you were. Um, But in some ways, they seem like they are for her. Um, Mm -hmm. But I've also heard, like, people say that after they've been to their own wedding, that it seemed like it was more for the people who were there than it was for, like, the two people who are getting married. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was kind of interesting to think about and thinking about, like, maybe she felt like she wasn't being considered in the way that her family was, you know, 
talking to her and talking to each other and then yeah. her boss trying to get um like a slogan pitch the oh, whole yeah, the way this is like weird yeah it was really strange mm-hmm. um well, there's definitely like a whole like i can understand like not really feeling like you're a part of your own wedding when it's this like big show and like Kiefer Sutherland is like constantly saying to her like I just want you to be like appreciative because oh, this was so expensive and uh, and they're at, at this massive like mansion and like and you I can see how you'd be disassociated from that like world right yeah and her sister and brother-in-law own the mansion mm-hmm. so. I mean, I'm sure that it was still expensive because there was a lot that went into it. Like there was the whole outdoor thing, the meal for all of those people. Mm -hmm. Um, But it didn't really seem like, I don't know. Like, why would you invite her there to have her wedding if you're just going to be like, well, this is so expensive. Like, you just need to appreciate it more. Yeah. Yeah, it is stupid. And so I can't understand about that. Like, um. I guess the disassociative thing like makes sense to me like just like kind of going down a spiral like throughout this whole event and I think it works really well almost as like a short film unto itself just like one like really strong chapter mm-hmm. but it's kind of weird because it kind of like it overshadows the rest of the movie in a way not overshadows because the end is pretty crazy but like it's just that that section's so strong and I feel like the middle is kind of like meandering a little bit but then it gets really strong at the end Mm -hmm. but um just by the end I'm like I don't know it's just it all works for me ultimately yeah Mm -hmm. I think maybe that the wedding stands out so much just because it's just one kind of like bizarre thing after another like very much when it rains it pours Mm -hmm. um and there's so many people involved and like by the time you get to the rest of the movie there's like only a few characters right and i think that kind of plays into the depression also is like it just seems like it's one thing after another and she's just getting more and more exhausted by the end of the night mm-hmm. um and then like the climax of that being her husband just like leaves her at the end yeah. of the wedding mm-hmm. after them being like this is gonna be forever um, I, cause it kind of does because that's how in life like you always think things are gonna just work out or be perfect or it's gonna last forever but things can always end on a like on a whim and just like that it's just done right and it's always kind of shocking when it does happen but uh yeah so I think that makes sense but one thing I was gonna say is like another thing with the darkness or kind of showing like a dark side of the depression is uh because like, she interacts with a horse at the beginning of the movie. I think it was named Abraham. And she's like, oh, like, I love Abraham. Like, he's the only one who lets me ride him and all these things. And, uh, but then later in the movie, she's, like, trying to get him to go. And she's, like, kind of, like, uh, like fiercely, like, beating him. And, like, he's a horse. He's big. But, like, it was still kind of disturbing. And um, I thought it was interesting just going to like the darker sides of people's psyches or things that somebody like a character might do that you wouldn't expect. I don't know how to explain it, but I just thought that was interesting. Right. And that's just showing like how far at the end of her rope she is. Mm-hmm. I feel like in that scene, just because yeah, you wouldn't expect her to beat the horse that she said that she loved like at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Um, and then I also, kind of questioned not just because of this but partially so when she says that like he's the only one that lets me ride him the um brother-in-law is like well he like I rode him yesterday or something like that um and so that kind of makes me question how reliable of like a resource she is Mm -hmm. Um, as far as like information throughout the movie, like how reliable is she as not the narrator, but as like a main character? If I think it's questionable, I think it feels like she's the main character at the beginning, but towards the middle, you could almost think that Claire is the main character. And uh, I know it kind of goes from each chapter, like that. This part's more Claire's side, but right. I just don't know if it's focused on like one narrative specifically. 
No, I'd be interested to go back and watch it again with that in mind, just because, like, my first time watching it, I think because, like we talked about, the beginning was so heavy, mm -hmm. I feel more focused on Justine. But, yeah, it really is split up, like, more, like, in the middle, Claire starts to become more of the, like, main character. Yeah. And with her being unreliable or, like, she does have, like, she seem, seems to, like, like, lean towards, like, fantasy. And, like, that could be, like, almost what the opening kind of thing is with all those, like, almost, like, perfume commercially, like, opening. Not to put it, that sounds, like, negative, but, like, uh, it's that way. very, like, austere, like, crazy shots. And, um, like, and then at the end where she's saying, like, she's like, I just know things. Like, I knew, like, how many, like, whatever she said, I forget what it was, but, like, buttons were in this jar or something. And, like, that means, like, I have, like, a higher knowledge. And, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, like, um, so I think that kind of leads, or what is getting at when she's saying all that stuff is, like, about her, like, like, leaning into fantasy and thinking that she's almost this, like, higher, not a higher power, but that she has more of a power than she really has. Mm -hmm. yeah, could, I don't know how to put it, but it's just, like, a certain kind of confidence she has. There's, like, a word for that, like, when you, um, it's, like, people who see patterns in things that aren't really there, almost, mm -hmm. like, um, can't think of the word but so she like guessed the correct number of buttons that were in the jar and then she it's I can't remember if she does something else that's kind of like does she have premonitions like I was kind of questioning whether or not she saw all of this coming mm -hmm. um yeah I'd have to watch it again to really like grasp onto that exactly of whether she knew it was coming or not i think there were like things where i was like hinting at that a little bit mm. but from watching it this last time i'm not totally sure yeah i was just seeing if i had something in my notes about it but i don't think that i do um Oh, and then something else that I thought was interesting. So at the beginning of the movie, they show this uh, painting called Hunters in the Snow mm -hmm. by Peter Bruegel, the elder, is the painter. Um, and then throughout the movie, there's other art historical references or like, um, I think it's in their library Justine goes in and like flips to all of these really um, kind of violent paintings in all the books. Yeah. And I'm still not quite sure if that was referen in reference to how she was feeling or if that was also kind of a premonition of like, I'm feeling this kind of violence kind of coming on in the universe. Yeah. Maybe that was the other premonition kind of thing that I was thinking about. Um, but the painting is just um, like men in the snow hunting. And it's a part of um, a series of paintings that depict different seasons. And they kind of reference how we as humans are powerless against the force of nature and like inevitably it will kind of come back and overtake us. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was some interesting foreshadowing, but if you don't know the paintings, it might not really mean anything. Yeah. Um, I so can definitely see there being a connection there. I know a lot of films like use paintings for influence especially with that where they're actually showing the painting in the movie but yeah i could definitely i think that's probably what you said is probably true yeah so i just thought that was like fun to kind of 
know about a little Easter egg that was in the movie. And I was wondering if Lars von Trier uses other paintings, like directly showing them in his movies, or if that's just something that happens in this one. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there could be more. One film I can think of that uses painting, a painting as an influence is uh, There Will Be Blood. There's a painting, there's a certain point where he's, um, I think it's Daniel Dia Lewis, they're on the beach and he's like crouched over in a certain position, kind of like grabbing his knees. And there's like a, there's a painting that looks exactly like that shot. And, oh, um, really? Yeah. And I know a lot of films do that. They'll, they'll take influence from different paintings. Mm-hmm. I can't think of anything specifically where the painting's in the movie. But I'm sure there's lots. I just can't think yeah. of it off the top of my head. Um, let's see. There was something. Oh, and something else that I thought was kind of interesting. And I know it was a snapshot of the two sisters. Like, it's focused on kind of their family and them specifically. But, um, you know, more people than them knew that this planet was coming because, uh, Claire is getting on the internet to research, you know, what is the um, orbital pattern of the planet and is it going to hit? Is it not going to hit? And one thing that I kind of would have liked to have seen is how other people were reacting to this planet coming. Mm -hmm. Because she inevitably tries to go to the village to be with other people. I like that part because and I almost think it's better just personally where it's kind of focused on all these people because it's more of a, I think it's the film is really about the depression and everything that's going on with these characters. And, uh, and just the fact that the planet is called melancholia, like it's pretty much, it's just a giant metaphor for all of that. Right. And, um, and when she, I like the part where she tries to go to the town and then um, Justine is just like, like, why are you even trying to go out there? there's nothing you can do a whole planet's about to hit and the whole earth is going to explode what what are you going to accomplish by doing that yeah like you might as well i mean i know i guess what you're saying like it's maybe some people would want to go and be around other people just to like while you go out but i don't know personally i think i would just hold up in my house and just be like just wait (laughs) yeah i definitely wouldn't want to go and be around people that i didn't know yeah like, that doesn't really seem like it has any point to it, except, but I think that's also the anxiety. Of, well, I think she thinks she like can it, get away, which, but she's not really thinking straight. Right. And that's the anxiety of, like, Claire mm-hmm. is because, you know, Justine is kind of sitting in it and is um, at peace with the fact that this planet is going to collide with Earth mm-hmm. and Claire is more like kind of whatever I can do to stop this from happening, but you can't. And I think yeah. that's a good. Um, it's probably also a metaphor for like the inevitability of death. I mean, that's like a little bit basic, but yeah. Um, but also, just another metaphor I thought of is, like, like whether they're, they're questioning the whole time whether it's going to happen or not. And uh, that could be, like, kind of, like, with depression, like, people who are suicidal. Like, they, they, it always, like, teeters back and forth. Like, they don't do it. Or, like, you don't know. You never know whether they're actually going to do something. And um, I don't know. But th- that's just something I just thought of right now. Well, and that's an interesting point because, you know, I kind of think about – at the beginning of COVID, when people were like, oh, you know, we're gonna take two weeks off of work and it'll all be straightened out. And there was a lot of questioning, at least where I was at of like, is this gonna be a couple of weeks or is it gonna be really bad? Mm -hmm. And, just kind of never thinking that we would live through something like this and then watching this movie and of course a planet colliding is a lot more drastic but Mm -hmm. just kind of seeing like how people actually reacted to this 
disaster versus how they reacted in the movie. It was kind of the same. Yeah, definitely. And I think another thing is like the way people react to it is like de- with depression and anxiety, it feels like the world is like ending and the world is imploding. I think that's another thing. But um, with COVID, it's interesting because like we never thought we we never gone through something like this. But we there has been a plague like in the early 1900s. It's just like that we haven't in this world that we're in with our, all of our technology and our society. We've never had to deal with something like it. And just it's interesting how we've chosen to deal with it. I don't know how to explain it other than that. But like if it would have happened in like the 80s, it would have been like totally different. Like who knows how they would have handled it. Right. Be- yeah. Especially because like we were able to, if we wanted to go online and look every day at the updated numbers mm-hmm. of your area to see people how can all work from home like we can all skype and we can all do we don't, pretty much don't even have to go outside right if we don't yeah. want to mm-hmm. so yeah that's interesting to think about too and they were very isolated it seems at this castle was yeah, it also, i was gonna bring that up it was also like um a golf course right yeah he said it was like 20 holes of go- golf or something okay. it's like this giant like a state but it looked crazy, and I would love to live there. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Yeah. That was something else I noticed, and I don't know if it's a golf thing or not, um, but he says how many holes there are. Like, I think it was, like, 19 or 20, but then later on in the movie, I want to say, I want to say it was Justine, but it could have been Claire, go to like the 21st hole yeah. and I was confused about that like if that is just some golf knowledge that I don't have or I'm not really sure that was yeah. about I'm not very knowledgeable on golf either <laughs> I mean I knew a little bit but I just don't know if that was significant but why they went to like that specific hole right but yeah I like they had these like stables and they had all these horses and it just seemed like I don't know if the, it was implied that the well that was uh that was Kiefer Sutherland's place wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I was just trying to think of like if she comes from a rich family or if she, or if Claire just married into a rich family. But she probably I don't know they're probably all pretty well off. Yeah, that's what it seemed like, and I think that's kind of what I was saying too earlier about um it being very much focused on like this is how a rich family would handle yeah like the earth being hit by a planet Mm -hmm. um and i thought that was kind of an interesting group of people to think about as well Um, it all feels very kind of lars von trieri or just like european like i don't know how to explain it 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 did feel very european yes yeah, even though it's in America and it's said in America, I'm pretty sure. But um, yeah, I mean, I like the film a lot. Um, I love Lars von Trier. I really love all of his movies that I've seen. And uh, yeah, he's one of my favorite filmmakers. I haven't seen Dancer in the Dark, which is a famous one. But I need to I see that. I have heard that it is so sad and that so you're so. depressed for like a week after you watch it. I already had the ending spoiled for me, but I don't know what how exactly it gets to that point. So yeah. I don't know really anything about it except that it's Bjork, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same here. I've seen most of them. I haven't seen, there's one called The Kingdom, but I think that's like a TV show. Um, what else? I haven't seen Zentropa. There's a couple I'm like not that interested in, but I've seen most of his like major works. The only one, like the main one that I need to see is Dancer in the Dark. Yeah, maybe we can watch that one soon because that's one that's probably one of his ones that I'm most interested in seeing. Well, from what I've seen, well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I definitely want to watch it. But like from what I've seen, I would most highly recommend out of all of his films, Breaking the Waves. Um, Breaking the Waves. Yeah, that's like one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, it's really good. It stars Emily Watson and um, she was in Punch Drunk Love. Mm hmm. And uh, also has Stellan Skarsgård, who was in this movie, who played the boss. So do the Skarsgårds 
are they in like a lot of Lars von Trier's movies? Like he likes working with them. Well, still in Skarsgård mainly. I think Alexander Skarsgård's only in this one, but still in Skarsgård's in a lot of his movies. I think this was an early Alexander Skarsgård movie. I don't know how much he had done before this. I think so too, because what this came out in 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about 11 years ago now. But yeah, I love the movie. I give it a five out of five. And uh, yeah, I just, it's probably, I think it's number two in my Lars von Trier ranking. What's it's your, like, in Breaking Waves is number one? Yeah, I'm just going to I got to go back and see what I rated this. I think it was like a 3.5 for me. Mm. Um. What were your main issues with it, if you had, like, just what brought it down? So, I think, well, it's not even really the fault of the movie. Like, it was on um, Pluto TV. Like, mm -hmm. that's how I watched it. And so, yeah, I watched it, it, like, on Voodoo or uh, on Tubi. On Tubi? It was another free thing, like, just like that. Does Tubi have commercials? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and I just kept getting, like, really, if I had seen it before, I don't think it would have been as big of an issue, but I just kept getting, like, I would get really into the movie, and there would be, like, a car insurance commercial. Well, that's pretty much um, what was happening for me, that why I was kind of getting bored at certain points when I, I loved the movie, but I think it was just the, it getting broken up with commercials like that. Yeah, and so I don't, I don't really even think it's, any fault of the movie it's it probably made the movie like three hours when it was like two hours and ten minutes and i think <laughs> my my biggest thing was that it felt so long and yeah. now that i'm talking about it with you i don't think that i think parts of it were be, was because um it was meant to feel that way like it was meant to make you kind of go through the like waves of being depressed but also that there were just so many commercials yeah um, yeah definitely so i'll have to find a different way to re-watch it because i have a lot to think about from talking about it with you so yeah but i'm you... gonna sit at a 3.5 right now um because i don't i don't really have any big issues with it I don't think mm -hmm. um but one part I didn't quite understand was um so as the planet is getting closer Claire follows Justine like out into the woods and she like is just like moon bathing basically she's like yeah, laying naked on a rock mm -hmm. and i was kind of wondering about the significance of that well, it has this crazy like musical drop that happens and right kind of, just the feeling of it like it feels like it's super significant but it's like but it seems kind of detached um one thing i could think of is when i was talking about how she has this like fantasy like a uh, kind of thing where she thinks that she's kind of like powerful in a certain way i think she thinks she has this connection with the planet in that moment because yeah. she's like she's like under the planet i think but um yeah and also the planet is called melancholia i think represents depression in kind of a way so she's connected with that that's the only thing i can think of right and i i think my favorite I'm thinking about like what is what was my favorite scene and I really enjoyed the hail scene where really cool. um Claire and just the whole scene where Claire is trying to get away and like take her son mm -hmm. to the village but nothing is panning out and then they're like on the golf course and it's just like hailing golf balls or like, yeah. golf ball size hail yeah the whole time I was feeling anxious because I was just like, just go back to the house. Right. I thought they were going to die Yeah. on the golf course, like mm -hmm. getting hit in the head or something. Yeah. 
but yeah, like I said before, I thought it was interesting how she thinks she can run away. But and uh, and we're all talking spoilers here. I mean, we've we've already been talking spoilers, but I because I'd seen it in a long time. I'd forgotten that Kiefer Sutherland like uh, kills himself because he's afraid of the planet hitting, mm-hmm. and that was interesting because it's just like really. And like I was talking before, how you you never know how somebody's feeling, and uh, and he just can't take it, and I don't know. Right, because he's very, very much trying to stay strong for Claire, it seems like. He's the one who's always, like, he's kind of hiding things and being like, there's no point in talking about that. Like, it's just going to upset everyone. And uh, he's internalizing all these things himself. Well, and once you get to the point where he does kill himself in the barn that kind of changes for me changed the like entire way that I was looking at him interacting with his son too because he helped his son make the um the little gadget where you could point it up and look and see yeah Yeah. how close the planet was and it kind of made me think how much of that was for him So that he could use, like, his son's interest in what was happening. While he also tries to track it. Right, to be able to track it. But he's not doing it. His son's doing it. So he couldn't possibly be freaked out about it, you know? Yeah. Um, I thought he was good at it. I thought he was good at it. Or go ahead, sorry. That's another type of, like anxiety I feel like like some kind of like quiet anxiety like you don't talk about it anxiety whereas Claire is like very vocally anxious yeah Um, yeah and everybody it just everybody reacts to it in different ways and I think it's part of like you have a juxtaposition between two characters and there's other characters who act in different ways and deal with this like very stressful event differently but yeah I thought it was really interesting and then They had, like, a housekeeper, right, that went back to the village. Um, I'm not sure. I think so. I want to say, like, early on in in part two, there was a housekeeper that went back to be with their family. And I can't remember if it was Claire or her husband, but one of them was like, you know, like, why isn't she here? Yeah why isn't she here like doing stuff for us and somebody kind of pipes in and I think Justine pipes in and is like well you know we don't really need her here it's time for her to go be with her people the way that we are with ours yeah if I knew the world was gonna end I would just drop everything yeah I wouldn't (laughs) I would just commentary on rich people too yes and so they expect to be served like every second well, and I, I want to say that it was her husband because it kind of played into the way that I was thinking about him interacting with their son as being kind of selfish of like, mm-hmm. like, of course, if you're a kid and there's a planet that's flying by, you're going to be interested in it. But at what point was he kind of pushing him to be more interested in it? just to kind of get the intel versus the kid actually still being interested in it. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, I totally get that. And uh cuz he was a kind of a questionable character. Mhm. But um yeah. It's interesting though. Because like towards the end, like when whenever it starts with like all the depression like with her going through this like heavy depression Justine and like carrying her into the house they they all seem to be very well, at least at certain points, they seem to be very understanding and very caring of, with her. But then there's other points where, like, Claire will say, like, like, I just hate you so much and all these things. But it's usually after Justine says something, like, incredibly hurtful. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I was thinking a lot about just kind of how, no matter how much you do to make someone who's depressed happy Mm -hmm. or like try to push them to kind of break out of that it 
doesn't like it doesn't really help um, there's really nothing i mean you can always try to help and it's nice but there's really nothing you can do for someone if they don't want to get better themselves right and also like the times where they're angry at her for being depressed that doesn't make her feel any less depressed like oh well i just shouldn't be depressed anymore because they're angry at me yeah. it just seems to alienate her more yeah and drive her to go take a nap or go take a bath mm -hmm. and they're very much like okay justine like don't mess this up yeah like you've got a good thing going on here yeah funny business and it's like okay <laughs> yeah now i can understand like i don't know it's just a tricky situation like because you want to care for somebody and i'm saying this as somebody like i've had issues with depression myself and i empathize with people and when i say that there's not much you can do if somebody doesn't want to help themselves like i still feel for people that have those situations but it's just okay. ultimately it's a choice you have to make so you can only go to a certain point like you know what i mean right and like yeah being in that situation you can know i mean you can't know how everyone would react when they're depressed but like we can know how we would react to those things when we're depressed and yeah i i agree with what you're with what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah i thought i thought it dealt with the topic really well like um there's a lot of movies i've seen like i mean i i tend to like movies that are very melodramatic and kind of deal with uh depression as a subject matter like uh have you ever seen manchester by the sea yes i love that one yeah that's a really good one one of the best in that subgenre. i love liza there's a lot but um yeah i just and it, i mean when you have a director that's good doing it it's gonna be even better but yeah, I love the movie. Yeah, I think you can really tell when a director is drawing on their own personal experiences with stuff like this versus trying to convey something that maybe they haven't been through to the point that they're trying to like make it seem in the movie. Because sometimes it's like, I'll watch something and I'm like, that is not how like de depressed people or anxious people really act. But with this, yeah. I felt like I was there and I was yeah. feeling those things too. Well, I did question a little bit where they're like literally carrying her in, but I'm sure there's people like that. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> there's definitely, definitely people out there who experience it that way too. I mean, there is times I felt like, I mean, I don't know, not to get too personal, but like, where I feel like I can't, like, I don't want to leave my room, and I don't want to do anything. But it's just like, I haven't seen, and I'm sure, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm sure it does, but like, somebody's in a car, and like, you have to literally pick them up and like, drag them. But, um... Well, and they had to even coax her to get into the cab from her house or wherever she was at before over the phone yeah. and she was like well what if i missed the cab and they're like well we'll just come get you like just try to get in the cab yeah and they're trying to force her to take a bath and all these things when she's at the house mm -hmm. but um yeah but I, I found that stuff really interesting though i thought it was a good part of the movie well and then but, it's her favorite food that ends up getting her out of bed right yeah, but then she cries because she says it tastes like ashes. Which that oh, was that was the, okay. I'm glad that you said that because that was the other, uh, the like third premonition thing that I was mm -hmm. thinking about was like when she says that the is it like it's like meatloaf or something? Yeah, tastes like ashes. Mm -hmm. I could see that as a premonition. Because it seems like out of nowhere, and like, does it even taste like ashes? Right, but. Like, but then uh, it's also that um that idea again of like is she clairvoyant or is she depressed yeah. yeah i could definitely see it i didn't even think of it that way but yeah i could definitely see that but yeah i think it's like it's not something i can rewatch all the time but it's something like i'm open to rewatching like i don't know every few years or so mm -hmm. 
but that's I how... definitely see myself going back to this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's what a lot of Lars von Trier's movies are for me, but yeah, I loved it. But I think that's pretty much it, but... um. I think so, too. I looked through my notes, and I don't think I have really anything else. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I didn't, I didn't even take notes. I've just been winging it, but I should take notes in the future. But, um, yeah, I think, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. But, uh, yeah, thanks guys for watching and thank you, Kylie, for being here. and reviewing Yeah, thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, thanks. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.